Once again, we're looking at King Jehoshaphat. This time we're going to be in 2 Chronicles 19. And the subject I'm going to talk about is sin prevention. What can you do to prevent sin from even taking place? It says in 2 Chronicles 19, 1, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. It's funny that Jehoshaphat is the one who returns in peace after what just happened in chapter 18. You see, Jehoshaphat had that ungodly bromance going on with Ahab. You see, they became best buds for a minute. Ahab disguised himself before they went into battle. But then Jehoshaphat wore his royal clothes. He, I mean, he went out there looking like a king. And the enemy that Ahab and Jehoshaphat was going up against, uh, they only wanted to kill one person, and that was Ahab. So Ahab disguises himself. He no longer looks like Ahab. And then you got Jehoshaphat going out there looking like the only person that they want dead, Ahab. So the enemy believed Jehoshaphat was Ahab, the one man that they wanted dead. And by the grace of God, Jehoshaphat doesn't get killed, but Ahab still ends up taking an arrow and dying, showing you that if God says something, that settles it. Ahab is the one who said he would return in peace, but the prophet Micaiah assured him that the only way he would come back in peace, you know, without dying, is if Micaiah himself was a false prophet. So Jehoshaphat returns home in peace. You need, you need to count it a blessing every time that you can return home in peace like Jehoshaphat did. But I want to talk about sin prevention. You may not be in a deep sin right now. But there are some things you can do as preventive maintenance. Number one, if you want to prevent sin, meet with the right people. You see, Jehoshaphat's been hanging out with the wrong crowd. But now he's going to have some good communications with the right crowd. He's about to meet with a man that will remind him that he is going to one day meet his maker. And that he needs to be meat for the master's use. So, meet Jehu. And in 2 Chronicles 19.2, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. He went out to meet Jehoshaphat. And said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly, and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So this prophet named Jehu comes out to meet Jehoshaphat, and he gives him a strong rebuke from the Lord. He says, Shouldn't, he says, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? When Jehoshaphat made an alliance with Ahab, he was fighting on the wrong team. He was helping the ungodly. He was loving them that hate the Lord. Even though Ahab believed in God, even though Ahab was a Jew, even though Ahab had prayed to God before a couple chapters earlier and maybe had humbled himself a couple times, this doesn't mean that he is someone that Jehoshaphat should fellowship with. He's not right with God at all. And the prophet Jehu plainly shows that he is ungodly and that Ahab hates the Lord. We knew that Ahab hates the Lord because he hates his words. What was that that uh, Ahab said about Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord? He said, he said he hates him. And that's because he just told him what God told him to say. Micaiah was only saying what the Lord gave him to say, and Ahab hated him for it. Ahab hated the words of God. You will notice that Jehoshaphat's response to the prophet's rebuke is much, much better than his father's response. If you remember, Jehoshaphat's father is Asa. He was a good king, but he gets away from the Lord toward the end of his reign. Asa gets away from the Lord toward the end of his reign, and a, a preacher comes to preach to him, and Asa basically has him put in prison. And he has a negative response towards the preaching. If you look at 2 Chronicles 16, 7, it says, And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, this is Jehoshaphat's father, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. 
Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house for he was enraged with them because of this thing and Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. So Asa had made an ungodly alliance just like Jehoshaphat made an ungodly alliance with Ahab. So it's like father, like son. And a cool thing here is that Hananiah the seer that preached to Asa is the father of Jehu that preaches to Jehoshaphat. But Jehoshaphat has a much better response to the preaching. So that says a lot about him. You can tell a lot about a person by how they handle hard preaching. Jehoshaphat should hang around Jehu the son of Hananiah. Uh, he should get some of his preaching tapes. He should read his commentaries. He should see how the seer walks. And a seer, S-E-E-R, is a prophet. In 1 Samuel 9, 9, it says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. But... Jehoshaphat, he's meeting with the right people. A good thing to prevent sin is meet with the right people. I know a lot of people that are meeting up with the wrong people all the time, and that's just making them get back into the same sins that just gave them trouble all their life. So that's number one, meet with the right people. Number two, take away what's taking away. Jehu is about to let Jehoshaphat know that he's done a good job taking away some things. And there are some things that will take away from your fellowship with the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 19.3 it says, Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee. And this is Jehu talking to Jehoshaphat. He said, There's some good things found in thee. In that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. So the groves were places where they would have out of worship. And cutting down the groves was pleasing to God for that reason. Men, you see, men love a shady place with trees where they can do all their devilment. And let me show you some things about these groves and give you an idea about how God feels about them. In Exodus thirty-four twelve through 13, he says, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee, and ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. So they had those altars and images, and they would worship their false gods and idols in those shady areas. But God wanted them to destroy the altars, break the images, and cut down their groves. And look at how Hosea 4.13, it says, they sacrifice on the tops of the mountains. You see, they're sacrificing the false gods and idols and it says and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms under these shady trees in these groves and it says because the shadow thereof is good that's why they would get up in these groves it's because the shadow thereof is good and you see that men love darkness rather than light because why jesus said because their deeds are evil and then in Judges 3, 7, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and the groves. So there, the groves are associated with doing evil in the sight of the Lord. They're associated with forgetting the Lord. They're associated with the false god Balaam. They're associated with all kinds of wicked stuff. There's, there's tons of references. If you just type in groves or grove, you'll see some interesting things about it. In 1 Kings 14, 22 through 23, it says, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves, on every high hill and under every green tree. So they like those groves because it's a shady area. 
Men like to do their devilment in the dark. But Jehoshaphat decided to take away the things that were taking away. Those groves were taking away the people's hearts from the Lord. And in your life, you need to take away the groves. Cut down whatever it is that makes it easier for you to sin. Take the lock off your bedroom door if you have to. Get rid of your cell phone if you have to. Quit working with that person you want to commit adultery with. Take away the things that cause you to lose fellowship with God. This is sin prevention. You know what it is you need to take away. I don't even have to really give examples because as soon as I say that, there's going to be something pop in your mind. You're like, I need to get rid of that. I need to take that away. I need to get rid of that channel. I need to get rid of that laptop, whatever it may be. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, it says, For they themselves show of us what manner of in entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Turn from your idols. Turn to God. Take away some things. It's going to be sin prevention. The more tempting, tempting stuff you get rid of, the less you're going to sin in the future. Now, number three, seek the Lord. In Second Chronicles 19.3, it says, Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. So Jehoshaphat made a mistake, but his heart is in the right place. He was prepared to seek the Lord. And most times people wait until their most unprepared moment in their life to seek the Lord because that's when they feel like they need Him. They feel like they don't need Him when things are going good. But you need to be right when things are going right so that you are already in close fellowship when things begin to go wrong in your life. So how does someone seek the Lord? It's simple. Just come to Him right now and talk to Him like you would a friend. If you're saved, just come to Him and talk to Him. The Lord wants to talk to you more than you want to talk to Him. When is the last time you just sought the Lord? I mean, you know He's real. You may even think about Him throughout the day, but when is the last time that you just talked to Him? Sometimes you forget that He's there 24-7, but He is actually much easier to get a hold of than any person. You don't even have to press a button on a walkie-talkie to get to get to Him. You don't have to dial a number. You don't have to send a text. You don't have to get a, a piece of pen and paper or any of that. You simply can say, God, and he shows up. Prepare your heart to seek the Lord. You need to seek him out because he's always there. He lives in you, and you're in him. Prepare your heart to seek the Lord. Ezra 7.10, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgment. Prepare your heart. Get it right. Realize, realize you've sinned against God, and God only have you sinned against. Realize He is the only one who can truly help. You see, Rehoboam did the opposite of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat prepared his heart to seek the Lord. But in Second Chronicles twelve fourteen, Rehoboam... He did something different, it says, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. See, you need to prepare your heart to seek the Lord. And if you're seeking the Lord, then you're not going to be seeking all that sinful stuff. The more you think about God, the less you think about sin. The more you think about the Bible, the less you think about sinning. If you keep the Bible on your mind, there is not going to be little holes for the temptation and sinful things to come in put some good preaching on while you work put an audio bible on you know a lot of times you're at work and you're you're not thinking about anything you're not talking to god you're not seeking the lord and all these sinful thoughts will flood into your mind number four sin prevention focus on bringing others back to god in Second Chronicles 19.4, And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the, through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. What a great statement. Pretty much every verse in this chapter has something great to underline. In my Bible, I underlined, Brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. When you are focused on bringing others to God, then this is going to help prevent you from getting off into sin. 
I make these studies to bring people back to God. I want to get people interested in the Bible again. I want to get people back into the Bible. And since I've taken this responsibility on myself to put out so many studies a week, it keeps me out of trouble. It's sin prevention. I've got my mind on trying to help other people get right with God. So I'm trying to stay right with God. I don't have time to get involved with the wrong crowd. I don't have time to get involved in Facebook arguments and TikTok scrolling and partying or even hobbies that aren't necessarily sinful but could just take away my fire for the Lord. Just, I mean, people spend so many time, so much time hunting and fishing and video gaming and Netflix binging and so on. And all their time's dedicated to just doing the stuff that's for the flesh, and all the time you spent on the flesh was a waste of time. The time that isn't dedicated to work on my family is dedicated to this, so therefore my hobby has become the Bible. My main burden has become the Bible. My main burden has become getting people interested in the Bible, so that's a sin prevention. So a good sin prevention is focusing on other people, specifically focusing on getting them to God, getting them to love the words of God. Focus on bringing someone back to God or getting someone saved and getting them in the Bible. I'm constantly trying to come out with studies that will spark someone's interest in the Bible in a way that they've never had an interest in the Bible. The next thing, number five, remember who you're doing these things for. In Second Chronicles 19, 5 through 6, Talking about Jehoshaphat, it says, And he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in judgment. Jehoshaphat is setting up judges to enforce God's laws in the land. And it's good to be held accountable to to what you already know you're supposed to do. Sometimes it's good to have that person behind you and pushing you, telling you what you need to do, even though you really already know what you need to do. But notice Jehoshaphat says to the judges, to take heed what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in judgment. You see, when you're focused on bringing people back to God, you need to remember that the service you're doing is for the Lord and not for man. That's good sin prevention. It is It is for everything you're doing for God, everything you're doing Well, I mean, you know it's for God. You say it's for God, but sometimes you start doing it for yourself. Remember, keep it in your mind. Everything you do in your Christian service is for the Lord and not for yourself. You should want God to get the glory. You should be pointing them in the the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ, not self-promoting. And He is the one with you in judgment. In 1 Corinthians 2.15, it says, But he that is spiritual... He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. You see, you're supposed to be making judgments. You're supposed to be judging if something, is it right or is it wrong? And you use the scriptures to show whether it's right or wrong. God is with you in judgment. Get familiar with his book so that you know how he judges. God is with you in judgment. This is sin prevention. You can get a self-righteous, Pharisee-like, haughty spirit when you serve the Lord because you start thinking that you're all that in a bag of Doritos. You start thinking that you're on another level than everybody else is around you. And then it starts to be for you and stops being for the Lord. And though even though you claim you're doing it for the Lord, you're really starting to do everything simply for yourself. Remember who you're doing it for that's good sin prevention because you'll start sinning through self-righteousness. Now the next thing, number six, fear the Lord. Good sin prevention is to fear the Lord. In Second Chronicles nineteen seven, it says, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. So fear the Lord. When you start being in the in the spiritual place that you ought to be, you will be fearing God. For example, if you're a mechanic or something like that, then you'll be honest with your customers. Because they may know nothing about cars. 
you you could easily deceive them, trick them, get them out of more money than they really need to be giving you. But you tell them what's truthfully wrong with their car and how much they truly owe you because they may not know what you're doing. They may not know what's going on. But God knows what's going on. And when you start living your life like that, that's a spiritual person. And that's having fear of the Lord because they may not know what's going on, but the Lord sees it. When you're in a spiritual place in your life, you should be... You should be a person that doesn't have respect of persons because God is watching you. You fear him, and he is no respecter of persons. He doesn't want you treating people different because of who their father is or who their mother is or what color their skin is or what weight or height they are or where they went to school. In Second Chronicles 19.7, it says, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. Fearing the Lord is sin prevention. You're dealing with the true God who came down in the flesh. He lived it. Uh, he lives to tell about it. And he did it without committing iniquity. It says, there is no iniquity with the Lord our God. This is a God who cannot lie. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God. He doesn't respect persons, and you can't bribe him with a gift. I mean, that's like an ant carrying you a piece of dirt and thinking he's going to get somewhere with you because he's bringing you a piece of dirt. If God wants something, then he can think of it, and it'll be right in his face. It'll appear. He doesn't need anything you can give him. You can't bribe God. And see, Jehoshaphat is explaining, you know, he wants his judges to operate with the fear of the Lord without respect of persons and without taking bribes. That is also how we need to do it. Now, number nine, heed warnings. Listen to warnings. That's sin prevention. Somebody warns you about things that could happen before they happen. And it's, it's sin prevention to listen to those warnings in Second Chronicles 19.8. It says, Moreover, in Jerusalem... Did Jehoshaphat said of the Levites and of the priests and of the chief of the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem? Uh, Jehoshaphat got some men in place for judgment and controversies. Today the Lord gives us evangelist pastors and teachers to lead us and guide us in the right way, obviously guiding people in the word of God. And in Second Chronicles 19.9, it says, And he charged them, saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart. So the man in this position of leading people needs to do it in the fear of the Lord. It's a fearful thing to be in a position where people see you as representing God. I mean, remember, it isn't just the pastors and teachers of today either. And I mean, all Christians are, are ambassadors. We are representing God. We need to work walk faithfully and with a perfect heart because when people look at you they're going to judge God based on how you act which isn't fair a lot of times because Christians don't act right all the time and obviously it doesn't mean we're sinless in our heart if we have a perfect heart but if you keep your heart ready to please the Lord and confess confess to the Lord when you mess up I mean that's having a perfect heart Second Chronicles 19.10 And what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in their cities between blood and blood, between law and commandment, between law and commandment, statutes and judgments, ye shall even warn them that they trespass not against the Lord, and so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren this do, and ye shall not trespass. So it says, warn them. Warn them that they trespass not against the Lord. And so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren. This do, and ye shall not trespass. See that? Sin prevention. This do, and ye shall not trespass. Warn them. And then you take heed to warnings yourself. Good sin prevention is taking heed to the warnings of others, maybe from your parents, maybe from your husband, maybe from your pastor. Maybe from your wife sometimes. Maybe even from your own kids sometimes. That's happened before. 
First Thessalonians 5.14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Acts 20.31, Paul said, Therefore watch and remember by, that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So, take heed to warnings. When you got something going on in your life, whether it be a secret sin or a open sin or a sin that you've not done yet but you're about to do, take heed to warnings. And then the last thing is, I really like this verse, Second Chronicles 19.11. And behold, Amariah, the chief priest, is over you in all matters of the Lord. And Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, for all the king's matters. Also the Levites shall be officers before you. Now look at this. Deal courageously, and the Lord shall be with the good. That is the admonition, the last admonition of the chapter. Deal courageously. You need to take courage. If the Lord is behind you, then you can do it. Joshua 10.25 And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against you, against whom you fight. So notice Jehoshaphat has all these authority figures in place. He has Amariah the chief priest. He has Zebediah and the Levites. You, you know, you need to be willing to submit and listen to authority. He got all these authority people in place because he knows that people need to submit to authority. Whether it be at home or at school or on the job, God believed in following authority. And that's why he's put authority figures in place. That's why he gave some pastors and some preachers and some evangelists. That's why he's got police officers. So, go, go by authority. Follow authority until it goes against God's laws. When it goes against his laws, then you become a rebel. Uh, sometimes rebellion becomes godly, as, as I've talked about many times. But most time, authority is in place to keep people in line and to keep people out of trouble. Not to get them in trouble, but to get them out of trouble. It is good sin prevention to listen to your authority that's in your life. But this has been a, just a quick study on sin prevention.